And so, Lord, it is all about you. And so, like the 24 elders around the throne, we take our crowns and we cast them at your feet. Lord, we want to cast them at your feet continually. And yet that means someone is putting them back on our heads as we cast them at your feet. And I think that's you. Because this is a shock. You're all about us. So God, may we be all about you because you have made yourself all about us. May we love because you first loved us and you haven't stopped. So God, forgive us for holding on to our crowns, for holding the ball <laughs> when you ask us to participate in the great dance that is your kingdom. We pray that we would do that now, Father, in Jesus' name. As we preach, amen. This is a picture of my dad. My dad uh, was a safety fanatic. It's understandable, though, because he grew up in the Dust Bowl during the Depression, fought in World War II, had siblings that died from disease, depression, suicide. He was a safety a fanatic, a fanatic about safety. As kids, um, he would make us come inside if there was lightning anywhere in the world, anywhere. <laughs> he wouldn't let me play football, get a motorcycle, or have a trampoline because they were all too dangerous. One day I came home, many years later, I came home to find my four children jumping on our trampoline in their ski jackets in the summer in 90 degree heat. They were like quivering sweaty balls of exhaustion and death. And I said, what are you doing? And they said, well, Poppy, that was my dad who was babysitting them. They said, well, Poppy, Poppy was afraid that we'd get mosquito bites and die. And so he said that he, we had to wear our coats and bug repellent if we wanted to play outside. My dad was really into safety. But he was just nuts for something else. This is a peak one in the 10-mile range. You probably recognize it right above Frisco where my Uncle Chuck had a log cabin we used to go in the, in the summers. You'll notice that it comes to a point. Got, got to remember to look over here. Uh, it comes to a point kind of like a, a lightning rod. One day when I was a boy, just dad and I, just dad and I decided to climb it together. We had plenty of bug spray, of course, water purification pills, hats for sunscreen so we wouldn't get cancer. And we started really early in order to avoid the afternoon thunderstorms to avoid the lightning. We started early, but uh, evidently not early enough. It must have been early afternoon when we made it up to the ridge line there on the left. I was hungry, exhausted. My feet hurt when I noticed, you know, little puffs of white that began to grow and turn black. Before long, we heard rumbling, then we saw lightning, and I remember I said, Dad, I think maybe we should turn back. And he said, yeah, Maybe, and he kept hiking, and it kept thundering. We were in sight of the top. I remember just a few hundred yards away when I looked at my dad, and his, his hair was standing on end, you know, from static electricity. And I could feel my hair standing on end. The wind was beginning to howl. The rain was beginning to fall. And then I heard like a crackling sound beneath my feet. I yelled at my dad, Dad, we need to turn back now, now. I remember dad looked at the peak, he, he looked at me, and I remember he had this like wild look in his eyes, like fire in, in his eyes. He, he looked at the peak, he looked at me, and, and then I remember he yelled, we can make it! And I thought, this, this is so wrong, this is wrong. Do you ever look around at this world and think, this is so wrong, it's just wrong. And then you look at God, your Father, and say, I thought that I was following you. You know, God, our Father, cannot choose the wrong because the wrong is literally defined as that which God does not choose. That's, that's evil. God can't choose evil by definition. Philosophically speaking, you could argue that no one can actually choose evil because reality itself is the manifestation of God's choice, his decision. So choosing evil is choosing 
and absence of God and his choice, which is the good. Choosing death is choosing an absence of the life. Every time you lie, when, when you choose a lie, you're choosing an absence of the truth. Choosing wrong is choosing what's not right, the absence of righteousness. Choosing the dark is choosing an absence of the light. Choosing to sin is choosing an absence of love, is choosing bondage to an illusion, uh, the void, nothing. God our Father can't choose evil, but maybe he can choose that we would gain the knowledge of what he does not choose, right? Which is evil. God our Father doesn't choose evil, and he himself tempts no one, according to the book of James, but he sure does seem to lead us into temptation, right? I mean, why else would Jesus say, look, when you talk to dad, say, our dad, who art in heaven, blah, 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 lead us not into temptation. Why would he say that if dad, our father, never led us into temptation? You know, the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. Why? To be tempted. Paul calls Jesus the last Adam, and we are all the first Adam, and it seems that God leads us into temptation as well. Have you ever been tempted? Are you ever tempted? God put two naked people with no knowledge of good and evil in a garden with an evil talking snake and a tree in the middle of the garden filled with beautiful fruit saying the day of you eat of it, dying, dying you will die. If that's not temptation, I, I don't know what temptation is. How would they have known that the word of God, the day you eat of it, dying you will die? How would they have known that the word of God is good. How would Adam and Eve have known that? How would they know that the life is good? And how would they know that death is evil? And we discussed this in detail last summer, but whenever God leads people into temptation, it seems he leads them into the temptation of putting him and his word to the test. If God says, and tempt and test are, by the way, the same word in Greek, If God says, don't covet, and you do covet, aren't you putting the word of God to the test? You're testing the word of God to see if it's good and if it's life. You are judging God's judgment. Well, God doesn't tempt us with evil, but he sure seems to lead us in temptation in a world full of evil and an insane amount of suffering. I mean, surely you've thought of this, right? I mean, you know that God could have given Hitler a a heart attack along about 1941 and avoided the death of six million Jews. Why didn't he do that? God could have squashed the very first little virus that mutated into the coronavirus, and then you wouldn't have to wear a mask. Why didn't he do that? He could have made women not sexy. Could have made whiskey not tasty. And he could have made life a little more safe. He could have just kept the snake out of the garden. And he could have just kept the snake out of Judas. Is it right that God let all of this and all of us go so wrong? What's the reason for wrong? What's the reason for all the sin and the suffering of this wretched world? Why would he tempt us to put him to the test. Why would he test us to test him? My dad wasn't God, and he did not control the weather and didn't want me to sin. He didn't want me to die, but he sure seemed to be exercising some bad judgment. At least that was my judgment of his judgment. The rocks were buzzing, the wind was howling, the lightning was crashing. I yelled, we need to go back now. And, and my dad, I remember, he looked at the peak, he looked back at me with this look that I had never seen before. His eyes were wild, his eyes were like on fire. He smiled and he yelled back, we can do this, let's do this. And we did. We ran to the top of the peak, and the wind, the rain, the lightning, we stayed there for only a second or two as we gazed at my, the view, and my dad with those eyes just screamed, isn't this wonderful? <laughs> Alone on that peak with my dad in the storm, 
is one of my all-time favorite memories. <laughs> it was the day that I learned that there are some things worth dying for. People will sometimes say, there's nothing worth dying for, which means, of course, that they have consigned themselves, in the words of Will Willimon, if there's nothing worth dying for, they have consigned themselves to the unpleasant task of dying for nothing. We all sin, we all suffer, and we all must die. Well, my dad taught me that there are some things worth dying for, in specific, the view from the top of the mountain. You know, it's not something that you can, like, get in a book. Like, look at a book of other people's pictures of the top of the mountain. It's something you must experience yourself, something you must feel in your bones and in your sore feet and even experience through the eyes of your father, the view from the top of the mountain. Did you know that according to the prophet Ezekiel, Eden was a mountain or at the top of, of a holy mountain? In the east, Kadam, which is also translated in the beginning or at the start or from the rising of the sun. According to many of the rabbis in Jesus' day, Eden was understood as this primordial and eschatological state at the beginning and the end of, of time. In the same way, the temple was to be this primordial and eschatological state at the beginning and the end of time. The, the presence of the beginning and the end of time, this uh, transcendent state. The inner sanctuary was the presence of the age to come, God's age. And in the sanctuary was a judgment seat of God between the two cherubim, like those that guarded the way to the tree of life in the middle of the garden. And of course, the temple was on a holy mountain that many to this day still believe to be that same mountain. Eden, Moriah, Zion, Calvary. It's the mountain where Abraham prepared to sacrifice Isaac and God provided a ram, a full-grown lamb in, in his place, a lamb. It's the mountain where David offered himself as a sacrifice in order to uh, save the people of Jerusalem and the angel of Yahweh withdrew his sword. It's the mountain upon which Jesus, the Word of God, offered himself on a tree in a garden. The earth shook, the sky grew black, and we took the life of the only man who is good as the only man who is good gave his life for all and to all in order to fill all and inhabit all and animate all. It's the mountain upon which the new Jerusalem will descend, into which will flow the kings of the earth, and within which is the tree of life in the, in the center of that, that garden with leaves for the healing of the nations. Perhaps all the chaos, sin, suffering, pain, and sorrow of this world is worth the view from the top of that mountain. Perhaps it doesn't last for only a second. Perhaps it's eternal. Perhaps everything that's anything is relative to that, for that is the judgment of God, which creates everything that's anything and even defines the nothing. So perhaps, perhaps our wrongs are not the reason for the judgment of God. Perhaps the judgment of God is the reason for all that we now perceive to be wrong. Last week we talked about Paul's theological theory of relativity. It's the idea that just as Einstein took the speed of light to be a constant, which revealed that space, time, matter, and energy are all variables or relative, in the same way we must take the judgment of God as constant, undivided, unchanging, and eternal, and see everything else as relative to it or to him. That is the light of the world. <laughs> Romans 3, verse 3 through 26. And let me say, Romans is hard to preach. It's hard to preach because it's a whole lot of concepts, but all the concepts have amazing stories tied to their, their tales. So, so I just want to read this and circle back to a story that should cause a storm in your soul and then reveal the view from the top of the mountain. If you're following along, you'll notice that I'm reading from the ESV, I'll put some things in brackets, not because those things are less literally true, but because those things are more, or literally translated, but because those things are more literally 
uh, translate. Most translators don't seem to have a whole lot of faith in Paul's theological theory of relativity. That's what I'm saying. But anyway, Romans chapter 3, verse 3, does their or, or our faithlessness, that's the vera, variable, nullify the faithfulness of God. That's the constant. By no means, hell no, is how that should be translated. No way. Let God be true. That's the constant. Though every man is a liar. That's the variable. As it is written that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. Now that's David talking in Psalm 51. But if our righteousness, our wrong, if our wrong serves to show the righteousness of God, what will we say? What should we say? That God is unrighteous? That God is wrong? To inflict wrath on us, I speak in a human way. By no means, hell no, for then otherwise, how could God judge the world? As if Everything is about God judging the world. Verse seven, but if through my lie God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being judged as a sinner? And why not do evil that good may come, as some people slanderously charge us with saying? The judgment upon them is just. What then, are we Jews any better off, worse off, or excused? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. That's David in Psalm 14 and also Psalm 53. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongue to deceive. That's David in Psalm 5. The venom of asps. <laughs> I always say, with my tooth, I always say that wrong. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. That's David in Psalm 140. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery and the way of peace they have not known. That's the son of David, Prince of Peace, Solomon in Proverbs 1 and Isaiah 59. There is no fear of God before their eyes. That's David in Psalm 36. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, writes Paul so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no flesh will be justified, made right in his sight. Since through the law, that's the knowledge of good and evil, reduced to human words, right? Uh, through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through the faith of Jesus Christ to all and upon all those believing. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short or have fallen short of the glory of God and are justified or are being justified, made right, being made right by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So who has sinned and fallen short? Class, all. And who is justified or being justified? All, the same all. That's the view from the top of the mountain. And it's worth all the chaos, sin, suffering, and sorrow of this crazy world. It's not just an idea or some words in some book. It's a living reality to which you are giving birth. Like David. Like Paul. Like Adam. And this is not a temporal judgment. This is an eternal judgment, filling all of space and time. So in chapter three, verse three, Paul says the theological theory of relativity, which we preached on last week, let God be faithful and true. Let God be faithful, that's the universal constant. And let every Adam be an unfaithful liar. We're the variables. And then Paul clearly implies that we should also let God's judgment be the constant and let our judgment be the variable. In other words, we cannot change God's judgment, but God's judgment will change us and the entire world. And then Paul quotes, he quotes David. Psalm 51, 4b, assuming that we all know Psalm 51, 4a and the incident to which David is referring in Psalm 51, 3 through 4, this is what um, David says. This, what, what David says is, is um, what he says to God 
before the judgment seat of God on the Ark of the Covenant in the sanctuary of the Lord on the holy mountain after, after Nathan the prophet convicts him of taking Bathsheba and then taking the life of her husband Uriah to cover his sin, in other words, to justify his own judgment. This is what um, David says after Nathan convicts him and pronounces God's judgment. He says, he prays, have mercy on me, O God. According to your steadfast, your relentless love against you, check that out, against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment, or as Paul quotes it, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. You see, David and Paul are saying that when David sinned, he sinned against the goodness in Bathsheba. And God alone is good. Against in you and you only have I sinned. And he sins against the life in Uriah the Hittite, and Jesus is the life. David saw the good, the beautiful, and he took it. Took the good. He basically raped Bathsheba. And to cover his shame, what did he do? He took the life the life of Uriah, so that God would be justified in his judgment, so that we would all look at that judgment and say, wow, that is a really, really, really great judgment. Do you remember God's judgment on David? Second Samuel 11 and 12. David is hiding from the judgment of God, for he will not let himself be false and let God be true. Hiding when Nathan the prophet tells him the story of a rich man that slaughtered a poor man's lamb. David gets enraged at the rich man and Nathan says, you are the man that slaughtered the lamb. Then Nathan issues God's judgment on David, saying you have despised the word of the Lord. David has put the word of the Lord to the test. And who is the word of the Lord? Jesus, yeah. Son of David, Lamb of God. Isn't that crazy? Then Nathan prophesies saying this. Number one, because you have taken the wife of Uriah out of your own, out of your own house, I will raise up evil, take your wives, and give them to another in the sight of the son. Now, as you may know, if you know the story, David's son Absalom rebels against David, captures Jerusalem, and he rapes David's wives on the roof of the palace under the sun so everyone can see. But check this out. It's not retribution on David. It's discipline. For next, number two, Nathan says, Nathan reveals that David's sin has been put away. It's forgiven. Sometimes we think that the forgiveness of God means that there will be no consequences, but it does not. God disciplines those that he loves. God disciplines the one that he loves, it says the book of Hebrews. So Nathan tells David that God has put away his sin, but number three, nevertheless, says Nathan to David, the child that is born to you shall die. I guess that's how God puts away David's sin. The Lord afflicts the son of David. David throws himself on the ground for six days, and on the seventh day, that's interesting, on the seventh day, the son of David, born to Bathsheba, dies. When they tell David, he goes into the sanctuary on the holy mountain and worships. His, his words are recorded in Psalm 51 and Romans 3, I sinned against you, Lord, that you would be justified in your judgment. And then there's a fourth manifestation of the judgment. David goes home and, quote, comforts Bathsheba. In biblical terminology, he knows her. But he knows her in a new way. He doesn't take her like a piece of meat or a piece of fruit hanging on some tree. He comforts her as his bride. She conceives and she bears fruit, the Prince of Peace, Solomon, the son of David. Bathsheba is the great, 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 great grandmother of Jesus. As Paul has told us, Jesus is the judgment of God. And now to think 
I mean, if you've ever looked at Jesus' family tree, it's shocking to think this is where Jesus comes from? The sin of David? Just wow, wow, wow. I mean, could there be a more incredible, better judgment for David's sin? And yet, 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 what came first? The judgment of God or the sin of David? In the Revelation, Jesus says, I am the root and the offspring of David. <laughs> that means I am the beginning and the end of David. I'm the source of David and the son of David. Not just that, the son of man, Adam. So we, Adam, we man, we think we sin, and so God judges, and so exhibits his wrath. But David and Paul seem to think that God judged, and so we sinned, so God could reveal the death and resurrection of Jesus, his judgment, and we could all justify his judgment saying, wow, that is an incredible judgment. I want to fall down and worship that judgment. I mean, this man surely must be the Son of God. David is forgiven. And David is changed, for a son of David suffered for his sins, and a son of David rose from the ashes of his sins, Jesus, son of David. Jesus, the word of God and judgment of God is how God makes David, the man after his own heart, the greatest worshiper that ever lived, the author of the Psalms. You know, Paul will quote David as if it's Jesus that's talking. Even Jesus will quote David as if it's him that was always talking. As if Jesus is the judgment of God in, D in David. <laughs> David, or Jesus is David's good judgment. The reason for David's wrong is the revelation of Jesus, who is the righteousness of David. The reason for the wrong is the right. And do you remember the reason for Paul's wrong and how God makes Paul and how God makes Paul right? You know, I think David was the chief of all sinners in the Old Testament. You could make a really great argument for that. But Paul just says in the New Testament, I am the chief of all sinners, like for all time. I have been crucified with Christ, writes Paul. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. It happened, you remember, on the road from Jerusalem to Damascus, when and where Paul was confronted by the light. The light said to Paul, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's me in them that you're persecuting. The light blinds Saul, but it's not retribution. It's discipline so that Paul can see the light of the world. To Ananias, who heals Paul, the light says this. He is a chosen, this Paul is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name to the nations. But I will show him what he must suffer for my name. That name, Yeshua, means salvation. Paul suffers, Paul dies with Christ, Paul rises with Christ, and Paul gives birth to you, the church. So what's the reason for the wrong? Well, isn't it somehow the judgment of God? And how does God make Paul, and, and how does Paul make him right? Well, isn't that the judgment of God? God chose Paul before he was born. Listen closely, God didn't do wrong, but he sure let Paul do wrong. He let Paul exercise very bad judgment. And then he revealed his good judgment, and so Paul justified God's judgment by preaching the gospel and giving birth to the children of God who are the judgment of God, humanity in the image and likeness of God. That is you. <sighs> so what's the reason for your wrong? Because you all got it, right? What's the reason for your wrong and how does God make you right? How does God make Adam in the image and likeness of himself? Why did he put a tree designed to kill in the middle of that garden on top of the holy mountain with two innocent, very ignorant people and then leave them alone with an evil talking snake? <laughs> I mean, how could God let it all go so wrong? 
Isn't it because he had made a judgment that has always been so very right? Maybe it's because he said, let us make Adam, mankind, in our own image after our likeness. That's the image and likeness of love because God is love. He said, Adam will love me. He will love me with all his heart, mind, soul, and strength, and Adam will love his neighbor as he loves himself because he wants to. That's God's judgment. And that's what was hanging on the tree. The good and the life, the love of God in human flesh, Jesus, our helper, our husband. God said, let us make man in our own image. Then he let man make a bad judgment in order that he might reveal his good judgment, that we might see his judgment, fall in love with his judgment, freely choose his judgment, and give birth to his judgment in this painful world. He let us put him to the test. (laughs) Why? That he might pass the test, and we would justify his judgment saying that is the perfect judgment. And I don't ever want to put him to the test again. Father, lead me not into that temptation. So shall I sin that grace may abound? Hell no, to quote Paul. No, I no longer want to crucify the love of my life, my helper. He let us know evil that we might choose the good, which is his life. He let us take his life that he might give his life, that we might receive his life and freely choose to become his life, the image and likeness of God. He let us all be unfaithful that we might see he always remains faithful, that we might fall in love with the faithful one and become his faithful body. He let us all be untrue that he might reveal that he is truth, that we might fall in love with the truth, not abuse the truth, but surrender to the truth and give birth to the truth. So what's the reason for the wrong? The righteous judgment of God. He consigned, these are the words of Paul, this is what he's working toward, he consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. And you see it happens on the top of the holy mountain. Paul writes, let all me, he writes, let all men be untrue. Why? Because God let all men be untrue. Not some men, all men. The problem is that we won't let ourselves be untrue. You remember what happened right after Adam and Eve took the life of the good from the tree in the middle of the garden? They hid themselves. From what? They hid themselves from the judgment of God, they hid in the leaves of the tree, and then they tried to justify themselves with lies. They were untrue, but they wouldn't let themselves be untrue. And so they were terrified of God's judgment, the truth. If you would only let yourself be untrue, because you are, you know, I used to think, because I was a pastor's kid, you know, I grew up in a, and I'd hear these great testimonies at church. I used to think that I needed, and I didn't have any. I wasn't a drug dealer. I hadn't murdered anybody, at least not with my body. Um, but, but, it, but, but I used to think, you know, I really need to sin that grace may abound. But now I see that I've already crucified the way, the truth, and the life. I don't need to sin. I'm already the chief of sinners. If you would only let yourself be unfaithful and untrue, you would see that God is always faithful and true and that God has made and is making you faithful and true and then you would have no problem with God making everyone faithful and true. With Paul, you would gladly justify God's judgment saying there is no distinction. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and all are being justified by his grace. All. All. And you see, that's the rub, isn't it? You can't be justified by his grace as a gift if you think that you have justified yourself with stolen fruit. (laughs) That you that thinks it can justify itself cannot be justified. That you, the false you, must die. 
but there is at least one thing worth dying for, and that's the view from the top of the holy mountain. Fourteen years ago on Thanksgiving weekend, I was defrocked from the Evangelical Presbyterian Church for not publicly confessing that God would not and could not justify all by his grace as a gift. I, I had seen that God had justified me when I could not justify myself. He even told me, Peter, basically, Peter, you, you, you went into the ministry because you hate the church. I mean, that's pretty bad. I had seen that I couldn't justify um, me. I couldn't justify myself, but God had justified me. And I'd seen that God had justified Paul. I kept thinking about Paul when Paul could not justify himself. And I had hoped that God would justify all by his grace as a gift, for I realized that none could justify themselves. And I was beginning to realize just why this idea made people so angry. If God justifies all, no one can justify themselves. And the self that believes it can justify itself must be judged by the judgment of God, for it's the work of the devil. And it's a prison, dark and deep as, as hell. As I told you this summer, just a few weeks before I was tried, on top of Lookout Mountain, uh, on top of Lookout Mountain, having just finished the sermon, as people were coming forward for communion, Susan grabbed my arm and she said, Peter, I just... I just saw your dad. He was standing right in front of us. And then I remembered she just couldn't stop describing his eyes. He said, Peter, they were like on fire. They're, he was so excited. His eyes were on fire. He reached out his hands, holding a bowl, and said, Susan and Peter, do not be afraid to drink from the cup that the Lord has for you. You see, I think all of that means let it happen. Let it happen. The storm, the chaos, the sin, the suffering, the sorrow, it's worth the view from the top of the mountain. I think the sanctuary is called to proclaim the view from the top of the mountain. And some of you have suffered for that and continue to suffer. And this is what I say to you. Go ahead. Let God be true and let every man be a liar. It will offend all men, and it will cause quite a storm, but, but it's worth the view from the top of the mountain. When Jesus hung on the tree on the top of the holy mountain, he lifted his head and he cried, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. They have no knowledge of good and evil, so let's show them. Father, let's forgive them. Ephemi in Greek, uh, forgive. Ephemi is also translated let. Let's let them. Let's let this happen. We can do this. Father, let all of them be faithless, and we'll show them that we always remain faithful. Let all of them be untrue, and we'll show them the truth, and that way we'll make them all true. Father, forgive them. You must forgive yourself. And you must forgive all men, all people. You must forgive everyone. And that can be quite painful. But it's worth the view from the top of the mountain. This is the view from the top of the mountain. I think he's so excited, and his eyes are filled with fire. And he says, this is my body given to you. Take it, eat it. What you take, I give, I forgive. And this cup, sweetheart, this is the covenant in my blood. Drink of it, all of you. The judgment of God. Well, that's the view from the top of the mountain. <laughs> Even if you only believe it like, you know, a little bit, like a mustard seed size, that's the view, and it'll grow. You know, my dad uh, did not control the weather. That's pretty clear. But I'm convinced if he could have changed anything about that day and that storm and the lightning, 
he wouldn't have changed a thing. <laughs> and you have a Father in heaven who is absolutely sovereign. He's sovereign over every raindrop. He's even sovereign over the devil. The devil doesn't agree with him, but you understand he's sovereign over the devil. And, uh, well, this is, this is the bad news. Because as I preach, I'm thinking, people, some people are hearing this as bad news. So this was the bad news. You've made bad choices. You're not in control. And you're going to die. But I kind of thought you knew that already, right? Didn't you know that already? <laughs> Kind of picked that up after, I don't know, just a few years on this planet. And this is the good news. Your father only makes good choices. He's in complete control. And you're going to die so that you can live and see the view from the top of the mountain. Amen. Every creature in heaven and earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is within them, saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever and ever. In his name, believe the gospel. Amen. Amen. Hey, if you'd like a prayer, members of the prayer team, be down front. And you can sit here in the train in the temple and uh, pray. And be sure to go downstairs, grab a cookie and some coffee, and give Chris and Kara a big hug, all right? And then we'll see you next week when we talk about relativity and the reason that is right, the view from the top of the table. All right, talk to you next week. Have a great week.